We will try to speak very slowly. That's better. Yeah. All right. That's great. We're happy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming uh, to this panel called All Eyes on Me. Uh, I'm Rafael Zanata. I'm the director of Data Privacy Brazil Research Association, which is an NGO based in Sao Paulo. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization uh, dedicated to research uh, for fundamental rights and the rise of data protection as an autonomous fundamental right and the many connections with the data protection with other fields. And here we have also Elena Secaf from uh, Data Privacy Brazil. She's a researcher involved in this project, which will briefly explain. And Eduardo, my old friend from TEDIC, he's the co-director of TEDIC, an organization based in Asuncion. Virtually, uh, we have Kisenia Bakina, uh, lawyer and coordinator of project at Privacy International, a very well-known organization based in London. And also Eduardo, another Eduardo and another friend from Buenos Aires, uh, which does an amazing work at the Asociación por los Derechos Civiles, ADC. Also very well-established and recognized NGO for digital rights. The context of this discussion here is an ongoing investigation which is being conducted by Data Privacy Brazil and TEDIC with the support of Privacy International, uh, which has been occurring for more than a year right now, about the datafication of border surveillance and the lack of transparency and opacity that we do have in those big projects. They are not well known in academia. They are not well known by citizens. They are really opaque. They are complex to understand because they involve issues of public security, of integration of different databases, of the use of technology in a highly problematic uh, area. As we know in Brazil, the border of Brazil is huge and many cities that are located in the border are also very violent cities, cities in which we have uh, drug dealing, traffic of human beings, many kinds of crimes and violence, which sometimes are not the same kind of reality that we might face in other cities like Sao Paulo and Rio and others. So it is a complex scenario, it's a complex social scenario. And there's also an increased complexity regarding this big effort of making public security and intelligence and the use of technology at the same time. So one of the puzzles uh, of this research is first of all to understand the institutional architecture of how these occur and make it visible to citizens. That's why one of the reports that was published uh, some months ago was about making the CEOF, which is the Center for Integrated Operations, visible to citizens, which is quite interesting because it is a partnership between Brazil and Paraguay. That's why we are uh, together, an NGO based in Asuncion and the other in Sao Paulo, to understand that and research that uh, in this kind of a binational approach. Right now, the project is moving towards understanding the use of drones and more specifically one project called Muralha Digital in Brazil. To not only talk about the problems of transparency and how it happens, how is the institutional arch architecture, but what is the deal in terms of fundamental rights? The question would be, all right, but so what? What are the risks and why this might be problematic when we're talking about human rights and fundamental rights. So it's another level of the project in which it is more focused not only in the description of the architecture uh, of the this, this systems, but also making a more clear argument about what kind of fundamental rights might be impacted. Are we talking about chilling effects in terms of border movement? Are we talking about new 
capabilities of detecting someone as a target when we have these integrated databases? Are we talking about the possibility of data breaches and data leaks and any kind of other risks when you have this kind of integration? So many, many questions that are together, uh, which are concerning us, in which we uh, thought that it would be a good idea to open up the discussion, even if it is a preliminary and ongoing investigation with all of you. That's why we're ha very happy to be here with you, and we truly welcome your questions, your participation, and your commentaries, which will also benefit us, considering that this is an ongoing project. So I will start asking Xenia to provide her remarks and having the possibility of doing research on many ju jurisdictions uh, also provide the narrative in which Privacy International is well suited to give uh, on the problems of use of drones, human rights violations, and the increased investments in border surveillance. So I thank you, Xenia, and I'll give the floor to you.
All right. Thank you so much, Xenia. Thank you so much for this uh, broad and really really good uh, overview of the approaches. Also reminds with uh, one theoretical debate that we do have in the field of data protection, which is about a right to reasonable inferences uh, based on metadata or data collected from social networks. There is indeed a very nice paper by Sandra Watcher and Brent Mittelstad, two scholars from Oxford University, about this, which is an amazing paper I truly recommend for everyone because it connects with this problem of what could be reasonable in terms of inferences, as your example about the bros uh, was very, very good. So I will give the floor to Eduardo Ferreira, our partner from ADC, for your explanation. And thank you for, for joining us, Eduardo.
All right. Thank you, Eduardo. Thank you. I think it is also really, really useful, um, the experience and the, the challenges of researching those suppliers. I think this point was, is very important for us as well. What we are understanding here in Brazil is that big companies, they do not operate directly in public procurements. They operate through local suppliers. So, for instance, Celebrite operates through a company called TechBees in Brazil. Other big techs uh, like Maltego, who offer softwares for public security, also join some public procurements through local suppliers. So this is also very important for researchers uh, try to use different methodologies, as explained, by looking through public statements, many other sources, to build a map of which are those local suppliers, because they do not operate directly. And I think this is super helpful point for this kind of research that we're doing. So I will pass to Elena, who is a researcher who is leading this work at Data Privacy, also conducting many interviews with former secretariats of public security in some states to, to uh, share some of the experiences and what we've been learning so far. Thank you. Thank you, Rafael. Thank you, everyone. Um, so um, what I have prepared a little bit for this presentation is to talk about the study that we have conducted uh, together, Totodiki and Data Privacy, as Rafael mentioned, about the center, the integrated center. Um, but I, I don't, I will not uh, sum up all of the findings. I think it's it's important for you to read the report. It's really good. But um, what I would like to say here a little bit is just to contextualize, right? The center, it is a center of security. It is a specific program of security in Brazil. And it is located in the triple border. And it aims to fight cross-border crimes in a way that is uh, inspired by the U.S. fusion centers. Um, and fusion centers are the centers that were created uh, after the 9-11 attacks. And it's their, the logic of the center is that they combine information from different agencies, they centralize information, they uh, produce reports, and then they disseminate it um, to the agencies again. And Siofi follows this this logic. So it 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 has the goal to produce intelligence, centralize information, exchange. Um, and it is coordinated by CEOPI, which is a body from the Brazilian intelligence. And uh, it counts with organs such as the federal police or the highway police and the civil police from Panama, for example. And so all of these organs, they share data and information and they centralize it under which is CFA, right? And uh, the center was announced in 2019. It began its operations in the beginning of 2020. And when we started our research in 2021, there was still very little information about how it was developed, how it worked, which actors were involved, which data collected, uh, and so on. And uh, so this integration, this strategy of centralizing databases, combined with this opaqueness of how it worked, caught our, our attention. And, and this is to say that um, CIOF is not an isolated effort that employs technology to fight cross-border crimes, right? So it's part of a, a bigger trend. And, and in this sense, the main goal of our study was to, as Rafael mentioned, to shed a light in this in this program, understanding better what it is, how it worked, and, and so on. And data privacy was responsible for the Brazilian point of view, and Tadiki for the Paraguayan point of view, and then in the end, we, uh, our aim was to connect the dots and collect the information to see if we could form a bigger, pic bigger picture of the center. And uh, we used uh, three sources for gathering information. Documentary reviews, um, interviews with people that were related to the center, and FOIA's requests. And uh, I'm saying this because it's worth mentioning from the beginning that even with all these sources, our final report still has some gaps on how the center works. And um, I'm sure it's not because we do as well, but it's because it's really hard to find information on it. So this reveals an important thing that was already mentioned by uh, the other panelists, which is the lack of transparency regarding how the center works. And uh, I would like to highlight two main points that caught my attention during and after the research, which are points that 
revolve around an issue of narrative. So the first point is this narrative of efficiency that revolves around the trend of integration and identification of public security. And the second one is the challenge that we have for creating a counter narrative in order to show that these are issues, that there are issues in this lack of transparency in all centers without, like at the same time, without diminishing the importance of public security. Um, so, moving on to this first point about the idea of efficiency that sustains this, this international trend, uh, I would like to highlight that just as at the other hand mentioned, the documents that we found in, in our research were very um, emphatic about the positive outcomes, highlighting that the center had like succeeded in arrests and capturing people, but there was not much information about the center. And um, also, uh, the interviews, at least the Brazilian ones, they were very enthusiastic of this idea, like integrating data, and it was this big buzz around everything that's, that, that this verification of public security, like it is necessary for the future of public security to work. And uh, we found out that, uh, unlike the fusion centers that uh, we looked into a little bit, CFE has no privacy policy document. And um, it also has no administrative act that regulates the collection and processing of data. So what I'm trying to say here is that together with this narrative of efficiency, there is this lack of regulation. And, this lack of regulation is not uh, the only disregard for phenomena that we have seen throughout the research. In fact, uh, one of the interviews when we were asking about uh, sharing of information with other authorities and how that worked, uh, highlighted that uh, sometimes these, it is important to have a relationship with other authorities from other countries, but that these relations sometimes they are informal because, that, and I quote, because sometimes excessive formalism can stifle the center's efficiency. So, um, all this agitation and excitement around efficiency, the idea of creating a pool of information that will help everything be better and faster, sometimes it stays in the way of the process of formality, and it is as if efficiency came first, like it was a greater goal, and then everything that stands in the way of efficiency um, should be taken out of the way, like due process, formality, data protection rights, um, and so on. And, um, and this lack of formality goes hand in hand with the lack of transparency in the center. So uh, even though we have studied very deeply, we still don't know, for instance, which data is collected, which algorithm is used, which people have their data collected, and the period in which the data stays in the center. So things that are very crucial for us to understand how the problem works, right? And, uh, and this leads me to the second point, which is the difficulties that we have, uh, the challenge that we have for creating a counter narrative. And uh, this, this narrative of efficiency, although it is flawed and inerrant, uh, is a very powerful narrative, right? So it, people believe it, it parallels with common sense, the idea, for instance, of uh, I have nothing to hide. Like, if you have nothing to hide, why are you against the collection of data? Right? There's this, this common, uh, common thinking. And uh, what I'm saying is that as an attempt to contribute to the question of what can we do as civil society, uh, I believe that helping create this counter narrative is one of the most important things that we, we should uh, try to do because it is, it is hard. And um, so we know that. Um, we know that this identification raises serious risks of fundamental rights violation, but how can we translate this worry for civil society in general? And I, I, I thought about this, I'm thinking about this, because, for instance, I gave the report to my parents to read, and uh, they are not in the field of data protection. And I read it, and uh, they said, okay, um, but isn't it good that the police are uh, equipping themselves? And uh, cross border violence is very serious. So, what I'm saying is, I think we should be very careful not to put ourselves in a position that seems to be against public security. It's like uh, we, we have the duty to create this narrative that we are on the same side of public security. There is no 
trade-off between privacy and security. Uh, this is not a solution per state. It's not sufficient alone, but it's something that I think that we should always think about when we're publishing and disseminating content in, in this field, right? And uh, just to just to finalize some possible guiding lines that we we thought about when talking to some experts in the field during the, the project is. Uh, to present, for instance, concrete cases of violations, which is unfortunate, but it's something that we can use to show that this is uh, this is something that is very bad. And also, one uh, one idea is like, is it to question the relative of efficiency? Like, is this really efficient? Does it help to maintain and promote public security? Just like uh, Zara's example of the. Uh, Costs of translation, for instance, this cost money is this really efficient, right? So, um, and lastly, to maybe we can challenge the concept of security. Like, are we really secure? We don't know how security apparatus operates, and things like that. So, uh, those are all things that I would like to, to say about the report. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we were very cautious as well how to present ourselves to the Secretariat of Public Security, because one could ask, could, could ask are you one of those uh, human rights guy? And we'd say, no, we're here to do research on how to improve public security. And they were like, all right, that's great, so let's talk. So we need to be cautious in the whole way, we talk to them and to be on the same page, as Elena said, because otherwise we can be pushed to the other side, like you, you guys are against it. So and I'll talk to you. Uh, so, Eduardo, I'm very happy you're here. Get to see you, my friend, and I'll give it to you. Sorry for the clapping. I got excited. <laughs> um, so, thank you very much also for inviting us. It's been, a, it's been an ongoing research, and it's indeed an ongoing research that uh, we're quite passionate about, especially because uh, we're also quite interested in the trends in the triple border area, which is an area shared by Brazil, Argentina, and, um, and Paraguay, because normally once technology is implemented there, it tends to escalate to other border cities, uh, which is one of the findings of the research, which I also very much encourage uh, to read. I'm going to try to be as brief and slow as possible, but at the same time, I'm cognizant about the time, so I would love to have some time to maybe exchange points uh, and feedback from you guys as well. Uh, so maybe for those of you who don't know me, my name is Eduardo, and I work at TEDIC, which is a very similar organization as data privacy, but we're based in Paraguay, so we're a digital rights organization, and we pretty much conduct research around privacy, human rights in general, and its implication on the internet and how we can extend those rights to the internet as well. So the research in the sea is part of this integral effort that we do towards an advocacy, an evidence-based advocacy, and also an advocacy, an evidence-based policy making. Um, so I won't spend any extra time talking about CEOF because I think Elena has done that uh, beautifully. But perhaps and to contextualize, contextualize things uh, on the Paraguayan side, I think it's important uh, to talk about that we're in a difficult security context right now, uh, whether we have situations that we have not seen that blindly in the past, as we're seeing now, which is the effects of drug trafficking uh, that have reached a peak that is translated in shootings in public spaces, also undeniable connections with politicians and influencing institutions. And this, of course, translates into a very palpable fear of insecurity. And I showed this at the beginning of, of, of this intervention because as civil society, I think that I want to replicate what Elena has said. We have to be very cognizant about the context in which we are, we as privacy advocates uh, and as digital rights organization, but it's becoming increasingly harder to address the importance of privacy without often ending up clashing uh, with the personal discourses of certain stakeholders that perceive and pretty much advocate that there are inescapable trade-offs between security and privacy. So that is something that we need to be aware of and sort of like strategize as to how to better treat, how to better not necessarily avoid the conversations, but to find common narratives. Um, 
So to continue on the CF and the research in general, I think that a very interesting, it was a very interesting experience for us because this binational approach sort of allowed to identify uh, not only let's say accurately describe the CF as much as possible, but I was also able to find inconsistencies around declarations at both sides of the border, which allowed us to then to do hypotheses and to sort of like infer as to how the system works. Um, so this was a very interesting experience and I would, I, I would I will describe some of them just to, to, to show you a bit about the situation. So to or to point my proof my point. Prove my point. That's the word. Yes. Um, so first of all, the research definitely showcased an interest of Brazil to institutionalize uh, and internationalize the CF. We were able to find a lot of invitations that been, had been sent to Peruvian authorities, uh, concurrently the National Police, the National, the, the Ministry of Interior, and the Senate Agency, which is the anti-drug agency. Um, but these invitations, and this is one of the first findings, uh, have not followed uh, international public law due process, whereby the Ministry of Foreign Affairs should have received those invitations to sort of like evaluate and analyze potential conflicts of interests and risk of violation of international agreements that the country has ratified. Um, moreover, and this was the one of the incongruences that we found, there are contested versions of both sides of the border in regards to membership uh, within the CEOF. For instance, we were able to find through the documentary review that Elena was saying that most outlets in the Brazilian side do point to existing cooperation agreements between Paraguay and also Bolivia, Colombia, and Peru. But the research from our end and both the interviews and the different follow requests that we did do not point to those international cooperation agreements. So where are they? Do they exist? Do they not exist? Um, we would say that at this point, it's still safe to say that there is no representation of Paraguayan authorities uh, within CEOF. But still, this sort of like contested narratives at both sides of the border is problematic. And it sort of like doesn't help to create a trust environment towards the policy. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that uh, there are some links to institutions that although there is no proof of uh, potential invitations sent to Paraguayan institutions, uh, such as the public ministry, it would seem that there is some sort of exchange of information uh, between CEOF and, and this particular institution. Um, it was impossible to fully confirm nor deny the existence of a direct invitation, but through the documentary review, we were also able to find that the public ministry was publicly stating that they had cooperation exchanges with CEOF and uh, after FOIA requests that we did pointing to that particular uh, news that the very public ministry published, uh, a response arrived pointing, and here I will quote as well, like Elena did, uh, that CEOF is a cooperation oriented agency for the exchange of strategic information without the need of a formal invitation or request for cooperation through, ch through formal channels. And this response also pointed out to spontaneous exchange of information to optimize task and fight against transnational crime. So here again, this narrative of efficiency, this narrative of optimization comes up again, and it connects very well with some of the interviews that the Brazilian side did, where they obviously, or they, it would seem that this spontaneity, this efficiency is somewhat somewhat of a common perception among the security and law enforcement uh, field, with of course an obvious disregard to potential scenarios of abuse when thinking in human rights in general. And also one of the most interesting findings I would say of the research is the international cooperation aspect. And this was something very interesting because at both sides of the borders we found different uh, different findings. Let's say, as Elena was saying and talking about the US involvement uh, in terms of like advocating for a center of this sort, we also found interested in the Paraguayan side from the European Union. Um, basically, the Eurofront, uh, the European Union funds international cooperation programs such as the Eurofront program, which is a program whose goal is to encourage exchange of information between border management officials and institutions and to sort of like uh, establish permanent dialogue between between them. 
So currently there are two uh, security programs called El Pacto and Eurofront, which are founded by the European Union. And uh, it would seem that the final goal of these programs is just to better equate how data from the triple border area and from the European Union in border areas are collected. And it's very important to see this trend, I mean, sort of like analyze the establishing of the sea of as a broader trend that comes from outside of our countries and is in a way advocated and or imposed by different uh, countries. And uh, connect also with what Senia was saying, you know, how technology is being used in different ways and how those technologies tend to be exported then to our regions without necessarily also exporting some of the safeguards that other countries have. Like for instance, in the case of Paraguay, we don't have a, da a national data protection law. So uh, we don't have independent institutions that can help navigate other institutions uh, to better analyze the risks and the potential implications the negative implications of human rights when talking about this sort of of of, of policies, which also I connect with 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 something that Senia was saying that the the ICO, which is the Information uh, Commissioner Officer, or I don't remember what the acronym, but it's the Data Protection Agency, sort of like talks about uh, the risk of too much data being collected by law enforcement. So it's a good example, I would say, as to why data protection is important and it needs to be institutionalized uh, in our countries. Um, just to wrap up, I would say, because I am within time, I think that now, uh, and I would love to hear some feedback about uh, the people who are hearing this, we need to further bring together discussions of privacy and this, of the privacy and the security way uh, and the security field in a way that is proactive and meaningful to actually identify the commonalities and connections between the fields that can ensure a rights respecting uh, or the enforcement of right res rights respecting policies. So uh, thank you very much for this and eager to hear feedback about the research. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, Officially, we had five minutes, but I'll ask your patience should be just a couple of minutes more. I will stand up and ask you to uh, raise, your, raise your hand if you want to make a comment, share your experience, or make a question. The, we do not need to be necessarily focused on questions, so if you want to share any kind of experience or something you thought about might be relevant, it would be great for us. Um, so please don't be shy, and I'll hand to you. Okay. Congratulations to you all. It's a very interesting uh, panel. It's more, uh, more a curiosity. I'm very interested in reading the research you talk about. Is it published somewhere? Can you uh, share with us? All right. And Lucas. Let's try this one. Yeah. Uh, I'd, I'd like to ask to Elena too. And uh, I, I was, uh, I think it's very interesting. I'm anxious to, to read your report. And I, I, was, I was thinking, I have a legal question. Uh, I was thinking about uh, LGPD and uh, the exception, because LGPD does not apply to public security context. And uh, I was uh, thinking if you, if you, have you heard anything, arg any arguments saying that uh, no, no, uh, data protection is not a problem here because it, it, LGPD does not apply or at least does not apply entirely. I'm asking that because I've heard this in different contexts. Uh, and uh, if, if you, if you uh, didn't uh, heard this, uh, what, what's your opinion on that? Uh, how, how can we deal with uh, data protection in public security contexts uh, in a legal context uh, where the, the law does not apply or does not apply entirely, or, or at least it's not clear what's the law that uh, regulates uh, this, this kind of issues? Uh, you mentioned that uh, the center does not have a privacy policy, and uh, how can we uh, ask then, you need to respect data protection uh, law, but uh, at the same time the law says that it not applies in that context. Okay, so a very hard question. 
But uh, what I can say is that um, during the the interviews that we that we conducted w in the research, uh, as Rafael mentioned, we tried not to say like we are for human rights and things like that. So we kind of let them talk, and in this sense, data protection did not appear as a subject whatsoever. So data protection, privacy, did not seem to be a concern. So I think we we were a step behind of, of saying like data protection does not apply here. We were in a stage where it didn't seem to, to matter anyhow. So this is something. And um, about how to, um, how to say that they have to have a privacy document or something like this. I think, as you, as you said, like LGPD does not apply, but it does not apply entirely, right? So um, the principles, they apply, and the logic behind it, it applies. And now, like data protection is a fundamental right. So I think there are ways that we can uh, um, not ask for it, but demand a, a privacy policy or an administrative act that regulates this because it is a, a fundamental right. So I think it's something um, something in this way I, I would I would answer. Oh, hi. Um, I, I, my name is Joan Lopez. I, I work with uh, Global Data Justice uh, at Tilburg University, and um, we have been interested in something um, in something different from uh, data protection, and is the dependencies that these kind of contractors generate in the in the in the um, public uh, security, in the public uh, migration administration. So I, I, I I'm interested in how embedded. Are these tech companies in the in the in the in the security realm? In, in this case, um, how is there this relationship between between uh, tech contractors and, and and public officials? And I think it's also a, a question for ADC and for Eduardo. Uh, it would be interested to hear uh, a little bit more a bit about this relationship and how embedded their logics are and uh, how um, interconnected. Uh, the, uh, you can see this uh, between tech companies and, and, and public officials. And the other thing is, is that I'm, I'm quite interested in this uh, cooperation between the European Union and the, and, 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 and the, um, and the authorities in, in, in Paraguay and Brazil. So I would love to hear a little bit more about the relationship between these cooperation agencies and, 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 if, and how profound uh, uh, is, this, is this relationship in terms of imposing or creating dependencies or imposing things into into public officials. So that would be great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, fantastic. And Global Data Justice is such an amazing project. We, we like it very much. Eduardo, it's in it. could you hear it well? And I think it was directed to you as well, Eduardo. If you could explain the embeddedness of private firms and those contracts and the complex relationship that you envisioned. I'm not sure if I understand the question well. I mean, um, it, it, it has to do with the relatively private forms. I mean, or... Of how private firms operate, make connections with politicians, make those contracts, they can influence the public debate, how they are entrenched, and what you learned from that. Yeah, well, um, that is. I mean, two points. I mean, state is a very good place in Argentina, and it's one of the most, one of the main models in the whole society. And even despite the fact that criminal uh, numbers are not as high as in other countries in Latin America. So, it's not that we push government to find good solutions to, to, to get more public support. And that's why it enters into the technology. Visible way for government to see, okay, we are doing something. And in this, has led to many private companies to get into contact with Argentina, and other factors have to do with um, a constraint relations between Argentina and other countries. So this is usually when you look at China, for instance, um, Argentina has a lot of commercial 
Um, to go to the international cooperation, the cooperation is currently fluent and very much live between the European Union and at least the triple border area at the three uh, sides of the border. So Eurofront and El Pacto are both security and migration programs that are being funded by the European Union. Um, they have... Uh, publicly available information as to what is the, the the scope of it. They have a very particular focus in training and training on technology and including technology in migration and border management in general. So that is a big uh, avenue of research that could be further explored. And what it, what we were able also to note is that at least from the interviews that we did is that Prawa is the one that is more advanced. Uh, from the three sides in terms of the dialogue with the region, but definitely it's an ongoing process also in Brazil and in Argentina. And what was also curious is that there was no information pointing uh, to Eurofront from the documentary review in the Brazilian side. So it's like different conversations are happening in different spaces and the very people who are involved in uh, executing these sort of policies don't really even know about the existence of the programs. So this is also very curious. Uh, and, and it takes me also to the incongruences that I was mentioning. So like different incong different statements as to how the sea of as a center works on at both sides of the border show like a complete lack of knowledge from the very people that is enforcing the policy. So it is worrying because they are the ones that should also evaluate if they are dangerous when when implementing the policy in the first place. Um, but yeah, the European Union is the one that we were able to at least point more directly as to very much pushing uh, for implementing integrated centers such as CEOF. Uh, and to the imposed question, I think it's a delicate question. I mean, in general, we are talking about very uh, defunded ministries in our regions so whenever international cooperation comes with the possibility of renew or like modernize a certain situation or a certain uh, public ministry and a, or a given policy uh, they tend to accept everything because they are very much defunded and they also need the resources so there's like different problems converging into one point uh, that needs to be analyzed just a quick comment. Uh, by doing this dual approach of investigating in Brazil and Paraguay, we identified some new things. For instance, when we were doing the interviews with the Brazilian authorities and public uh, secretaries, they mentioned some visits to Texas. They went to Texas in 2016 to visit the fusion centers. They went in 2019. There was a lot of lobby by those fusion centers and some tech companies to you know open these markets. But then we went doing the research in Paraguay, we discovered many issues about the Eurofront program that were not revealed by 
the freedom of information request in Brazil. Uh, so it was really important to to contrast and to and to build up this knowledge. There was another question. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Um, first, I just wanted to say um, congratulations on, to everyone on the panel and all of the work that you've done. Um, I'm such a fan of all of the organizations um, participating today. Um, I'm Hannah Draper. I was um, an international digital rights funder for um, almost a decade and now working as a, a consultant and strategist. I had a question. Um, Actually, this is something um, I've chatted a little bit about with PI folks in London over drinks in the past, but if, uh, regarding the European context um, and with some other uh, digital rights groups working in Europe as well. And um, I'm wondering uh, whether, in addition to regulatory approaches, do you see any opportunity for um, strategic litigation to protect the fundamental rights of privacy, but also due process? I think um, in Europe, um, I'm sorry, and I'm speaking in particular about in the context of migrants. Um, to the best of my knowledge, that work in Europe hasn't really taken off, but I was wondering with the inter-American framework if that could be a possibility to explore or if it's something people are already working on and I'm just naive. <laughs> Thank you again. So let me get a final question and then I'll ask Senia to answer uh, considering that we'll need to conclude. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jesus. I come from Mexico and I want to know how can we deal with these topics when they fall on national security as a limit for privacy, for data protection, and even transparency or access of, for information? As you have tell, told us, there is a um, lack of information available for on these topics. How can we deal even the research of the topics when we cannot find information? Thank you, Jesus. It's a great and really tough question. So I'll ask Senia and Eduardo if you want to answer. Uh, Hannah Draper made a question more specifically for you, Senia, on litigation and the work of PI. So maybe we can start from that and then pass to Eduardo and we'll, we'll make a final round here to conclude the panel. All right. So Hannah, just to rephrase, also opportunities for international law and inter-American? What, what kind of framework on human rights, Hannah? Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Well, uh, I think we can. I think a lot of the time um, we look to Europe for the moral authority, and I don't think that that makes sense a lot of the time. And I think that a lot of people working in this space from you know the minority world, the first world, really look to um, to Europe, for example. But if that is maybe stalled, I'm wondering if there are opportunities to protect due process rights, privacy rights, um, which you know all are human rights. All humans are meant to have them. But when you're a migrant, nobody. It's very difficult to exercise those rights, and it's. I feel from my perspective. So this is, I guess, my question: Is um, you know, are there opportunities to use, for example, the inter-American human rights framework to advance like a strategic litigation, or is anybody thinking about that? Is basically my question because I've found often there are opportunities in the Americas um, that could actually have international um, benefits. Great, thanks, Hannah. Okay, so Xenia and Eduardo, I'll give it to you.
topic today is quite sensitive. Um, but when it comes to migrants, uh, they are like, uh, often disregarded in the law. Um, so I don't think that's why the inter-American race treaty uh, approach or um, a question, but um, I'm not sure if I know that much of it, about how it is actually good to be able to do that if you want to do this in case you have to write. Right, thank you. Thank you so much. Eduardo, how, how to deal with the national security argument? That was the point made by Jesus um, for, for your final comments. All right, thank you. So give it to Eduardo and then Elena. I think um, in, 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 in relation to all questions or like as a general thought? Could be. Yeah. Could, yeah, okay, us. yeah. I think that to Hannah's point, the issue of the Inter-American Court is an interesting opportunity, but of course being cognizant of how costly and how long those processes take, uh, maybe it's not the best avenue for, I would say, immediate results, but it is indeed an interesting avenue to 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 explore. We have been exploring this interdict through strategic litigation as well there, so so I would say it's a worth it's it's a worthy avenue. And to Jesus' point, um, I think that one of the learnings from our research at least was that even though for instance we weren't able to gather that much information from the FOIAs and we did actually get a lot of information from the documentary review but the FOIAs were very vague but the issue of granting anonymity to interviewees like from a practical standpoint at least was very useful like those were pretty much the main uh, data collection sources that we had to, to to connect the missing dots and you have to of course create a, a trust an environment of trust with your interviewees but it is indeed also an interesting uh, learning experience that we have like by granting this anonymity you definitely access more information through those interviews All right. okay so just a, a final remark i don't have the answer to how to solve this problem but something that i think it's useful as well not only uh this counter narrative for society in general but also to present ourselves um ngos and civil society representatives as a open channel for the government to speak so like this non-combative language uh this um something just to if they have doubts they can come talk to us and we won't uh we can help right this idea of helping so i think this is something i would like to say as a final remark and thank you everyone okay. so i'd like to thank xenia and eduardo from from connecting from buenos aires in london thank you so much <laughs> thanks eduardo elena thanks eduardo matos and all the staff of fgv for all your support in this conference
And thank you all for the presence, the members of the Brazilian Bar Association and many other friends. It was a, a great discussion. We're truly honored with your presence here and have a good day. Thank you.